Pastor John, what does it mean when the Apostle Paul calls Christians to walk by the Spirit or, or to keep in step with the Spirit? What does Paul mean by these phrases? This morning, Tony, I was reading Galatians 5 as part of my regular walk through the Bible. And every time I come to Galatians 5, I am struck again by this a gathering together of statements about how I'm supposed to live by the Spirit. Here they are. Verse 16, walk by the Spirit. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Verse 22, bear the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 25, live by the Spirit. Second in that verse, keep in step with the Spirit. So five different statements. And every time I read them, I say, oh, Lord, I want to do that. I want to know experientially what does it mean to walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit and live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. And and I think the key is back in Galatians 3, because there we we have an instruction about how the Spirit came to us the first time and how it keeps on being supplied. So in chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So it tells you the Spirit came to you through faith the very first time you you received the holy spirit when you put your trust in christ that that faith became the channel and i think the spirit created that channel by which you're united to christ and the spirit flows into you by virtue of your union with christ through faith and then he says in verse 5 does he who supplies so now here we've got not the past receiving, but the ongoing supply, does he who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you, and I think that would that would be not simply signs and wonders kinds of miracles, though that wouldn't be excluded. It's also love, joy, peace, patience. I mean, the stuff that really makes us frustrated that we can't be better at. It's the Spirit that, that works those. Does, does he work those by works of the law or by hearing with faith, exactly the same way we started. So you began by receiving the Spirit by faith. You go on experiencing the supply of the Spirit by faith. So if if a person asks, well, these sound very passive, be led by the Spirit, bear fruit of the Spirit, and, and they are. I mean, the Spirit is God. He does things on us and in us, but the thing we're called to do is to hear, and I think that would mean hear the Word of God, hear the promises of God, hear the Gospel of God, and believe it, and on that belief, through that belief, the Holy Spirit comes. You see, the flesh has a voice, the devil has a voice, and the world has a voice. How do I know it's the Holy Ghost? How do I know it's the Holy Spirit? Now, there are many of you listening to me now, and many in the ministry, who can't accept this walk of having a constant, uninterrupted voice of the Holy Spirit directing your life. Because you have tried to trust that voice or tried to hear the voice of the Lord and somewhere, sometime, you made a mistake or you say it didn't happen. I thought I heard the Holy Ghost, but it was not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are safeguards God would never allow his people who seek to be led by the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit as directed by the word and then let them be deceived. Impossible. Not when you're on your face, not when you're seeking him, not when you're asking for the cleansing and not when you believe that the Holy Ghost mortifies the deeds of the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit. You cannot mortify your sin. There's no other way but faith in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you mortify The deeds of the flesh through the Spirit, you shall live, the Scripture says. Now, let me talk about the safeguards. Ephesians 6.16. What about, you see, see, if if you're going to have the safeguards, it requires another divine yes. It has to be an intractable divine yes. Uh, 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 I will believe. If I'm going to walk this kind of walk, I'm going to believe 
that the Holy Spirit will keep His Word. I'll take these other promises. He has promised to protect us. These are protective promises so that we know the Lord. Jesus said, you, the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit, but you know Him. You know Him. You know Him by familiarity, by spending time with Him, by trusting in Him. But let me give you the safeguards, please. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith, that you may be able to quench the devil's voice, every word that comes from his mouth, everything he tries to, in, in, to, to inject into the, to the mind. These are fiery darts of Satan. And there is only one protection, and that is to believe what God said. If you will believe me, if you will take this step of faith, and you will consult me, if you will walk in the Spirit, in other words, trust Him, that when you seek Him, and when you believe that He abides in you, and that He has a voice, that He will speak and He will lead and guide and keep you from evil, He will keep you from disaster, He will keep you from these terrible mistakes that we make in life. He said... Will you believe that I have a shield? I am your shield and I will protect you. I will keep it and trust that he knows how to do it. There's no preacher anywhere can explain how he puts up the shield. My part is to believe that he has promised to be a shield to me. And I go to prayer waiting on the Holy Spirit and praying, Holy Spirit, you shield me from any voice of the enemy. You shield me from the voice of the flesh. There's another scripture. For... The flesh lusts or fights against the Spirit. And we're talking about now discerning the Holy Spirit from the, spirit, the voice of the flesh. And here's the promise. The flesh lusts or fights against the Spirit. And the Spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And now you have the voice of the flesh and you have the Holy Spirit in my heart. There, there, in this body of mine, there are two voices that are clam the, the, the voice of flesh always clamoring for attention and always trying to tell me what to do. Always tell me it's right. Always tell me go to get some counselors to agree with my way. And then go to God and pray and God has to bless it. Do it my way and then go to prayer and ask God to just bless what I have. I hear people say, well, God's given us a sound mind. We have an intelligent mind. And, and God helps those who help themselves. And, and I'm just going to use my intelligent spiritual mind. Well, then you're acting on your own will, I believe. Yes, he does. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying you go to your closet and say, Holy Spirit, what dress do I wear or what color suit do I put on today? I'm not asking you to go to the Holy Ghost and ask him what cereal you pick for breakfast. I'm asking you for all of these all of these things that have to do with walking. Walking. Signs that show we are walking in the Spirit. After giving your lives to Christ and confessing Him as our Lord and Savior, our Christian journey begins. A lot of people have the misconception that is end, but it really isn't. It's only the beginning of many spectacular changes that will take place in the time to come as we continue on this eternal path. As we grow in our journey with Christ as a believer, there are visible signs and changes that confirm our growth in Christ and tell whether we are on the right path or not. As a child, my father used to always tell me, growth is a principle. If something is not growing, there is a problem. I believe this to be absolutely true in the spiritual sense. Luke 2 verse 52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Now in the Bible we see this wonderful term, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit, you first need to receive the Spirit. The Spirit we are talking about here is the Holy Spirit. He is the helper for Christians who want real results in their Christian walk. The Holy Spirit comes with a wonderful range of benefits to the believer. He gives us power to overcome the challenges of life. 
to bear the greatest burdens and adversity. This is why you find saints who are filled with the Holy Spirit still have joy during the sorrows of life. He is also a guide. He will guide into all truth. He knows the way Jesus opened when he was on earth, the way which leads you away from everything harmful and negative and toward what blesses and benefits your neighbor, filling you with joy and peace. Therefore, to live a life in the Spirit, a life that walks in the Spirit and not the flesh, is a life centered around the Holy Spirit. Here are four signs that show that we are walking in the Spirit. Firstly, an individual begins to deliberately chase after Christ and the things of the Spirit. Growth is intentional, not accidental. Just as we are conscious about our physical growth, nurture our bodies and keep it healthy, so it is when it concerns the Spirit. There has to be a conscious effort of abiding in Christ, the determination to follow His commandments and do whatever He asks. 1 John 3 verse 24 Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Chasing after Christ isn't necessarily about doing activities or busy working for him, as many of us have termed it to mean. Although our service and willingness to do God's work or be an instrument in his service is also a further confirmation that we love him, but that isn't all there is to it. We need to make sure that we keep his commands and maintain our connection through prayer, trust and constant yielding and brokenness in spirit. It's not about working for him, it's also about letting him work in us too. Secondly, our gaze is not fixated on fleshly desires. The more we journey with God and walk in the spirit, the more we see the desires to gratify the desires of the flesh die and fade away. This isn't because of our own willpower, but because of the spirit of God that's at work in us. Galatians 5 verse 16 to 17 So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit likes what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Apostle Paul pointed out to us in this verse that it's not by our power that the natural man gives way to Christ, but by abiding and walking in the Spirit. When we find out that the mundane things that normally get us attracted, excited or distracted, no longer please us or tickle our fancy, it's a good sign that God's Spirit is mightily at work in us. When we no longer yield to the yearnings of the flesh and all our priorities are things that pertain to the knowledge of God, we can be said to be walking in the Spirit. Thirdly, another sign is that yielding to the things of the Spirit comes easily for you. Walking in the Spirit makes keeping the laws and commands of God easier. If at every point in our Christian journey we struggle to obey God's instructions, or find it difficult to follow God's leading our struggle surrender to God's will, rather than our own, then it might be that we haven't surrendered to Him fully, and let Him have His way in us. We won't dilly-dally or wait to be dragged before expressing our love for Him, if His Spirit is at work in us. To walk in the Spirit also makes us overcome all kinds of temptations that might appear in our lives, even when our fellow humans tempt us and are incited to retaliate or react in a very unpleasant way. We hold our peace and resolve the situation amicably without escalating. Romans 12 verse 21 Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This will be our anchor scripture when we are faced with situations that will ordinarily make us react in a retaliative or destructive way. Fourthly and finally, we are producing good fruits. The fruits we produce indicate whether we are truly walking in the spirit or just trying to keep up appearances. The book of Galatians 5 verse 19 to 26 clearly states that the acts of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit Galatians 5 verse 22 to 26 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 23. A gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. 24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. 
When we see these fruits manifest in our lives and are our default resolve to handle and approach any situation that we are going through in life, it shows that we are yielding and giving in to the work of Christ in us. As we continue to yield, these fruits become more pronounced in our lives. We will be continuously transformed so we think and act differently from who and what we used to be. Before we were angry, now we become more patient. Before we wanted to control people, it's interesting, one of the fruit of the Spirit is not controlling people, it's controlling yourself. You will always know that the Holy Spirit is active in your life if you don't control your husband, but you control your emotions. You don't control your children, but you control your mouth. You can control yourself, you know the Holy Spirit is at work. If you're always running, controlling other people, you're operating in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is not even near leading your life at that point. Write down this thing about the fruit of the Spirit. is It's fruit, not works. If you have to work at it, it's flesh. People who say, I work on my character, flesh. You never see Jesus calling his disciples to come and work on their character. He always called them to follow him. He says, build intimacy. I'll change your character. Cultivate relationship with God. Your cussing issue, your anger issue, your controlling issue, your pessimism issue. He will begin to work on that. It's a fruit of the Spirit, not work. If you have to work at it now, I do understand it's yielding to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To work out those things God has worked in. But what we're talking about right now is to allow the cultivator relationship. And He begins to work on you by bringing those areas into service. The second thing is all of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it's interesting that it says it's a fruit. And it mentions nine characteristics. Now, I'm not like the best in English. But if it mentions nine characteristics, it should say fruits. Which I heard a lot of Christians say, it's the fruits of the Spirit. It never says fruits of the Spirit. It says fruit of the Spirit. That means all of those nine characteristics, the Holy Spirit develops at the same time. See, you can develop one of them at the expense of the other on your own. It's called work of the flesh. When the Holy Spirit develops them, He doesn't develop self-control without kindness. You don't become so meek and then you become so weak. He develops all of that at the same time. You and I cannot do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. That's why it's called a fruit, not fruits. And it's interesting, all the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit are not actions. If you check the work of the flesh before that, you see that all of the works of the flesh are actions. Murder, adultery, it's all actions. The fruit of the Spirit is all about attitude. Holy Spirit is far more concerned on how you say things, how than what. Attitude. It's one of those things you can't point out in people. It's like when somebody released gas in the room. You can't point a finger. You know it smells. You know they did it. But you have no evidence. The only thing you do is you go like this. When somebody has an attitude, it's exactly the same. When somebody has an attitude, you come to me, it's like, you know, your attitude stinks. Isn't that what you say? They're like, what are you, what are you saying? Everything is fine. That's an attitude problem. Holy Spirit will always work on your attitude more than your actions. Another thing about the fruit of the Spirit is it feeds others. Bring me my apple. You see the difference between an apple and an apple. One you wear, the other one you eat. This is the gifts. This is the fruit. When you allow the Holy Spirit to work on you because you're intimate with Him, remember this people around you will be fed by you. Your spouse will say, my husband is awesome. Your kids will say, I have the best dad. The church will say, we're so blessed to have this person. Remember this, when your character is influenced by the Holy Spirit, with gifts you will impact, with fruit you'll feed. It's not the fruit of your life, this is the fruit of the Spirit's life. So what do you do with fruit? 
like we've been we've been convinced by religion. We're supposed to produce fruit for everybody else. We're supposed to produce love. We're supposed to have love for everybody else. We have to have joy when people mistreat us. We're peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, faithfulness. Like we have to bear all this fruit so everybody can eat of our fruit wrong. This is the fruit of the spirit that we get to eat from. You have to eat of it first. And as you eat of it, not as you produce it, as you what do you do with fruit? You eat it. What do you do with like we've missed the whole point of what fruit is for? Well, the fruit of the spirit and, you know, we have books and and we have materials about the fruit of the spirit in the body of Christ. And it's got grapes and oranges and bananas on the and we're supposed to produce all this fruit. What are we supposed to do with it? Look at a picture and say, oh, isn't that pretty fruit? No, we're designed by God to eat of the fruit. And when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, here are the trees with fruit on all the trees. Eat freely. Beloved, we are not being ordered by God to produce something. We're offered by God to eat something. So we eat of God's love. We enjoy his joy. We eat of his peace. We partake of his patience. God is patient. We're not. Why are we trying to manufacture patience without first partaking of his patience toward us? You cannot produce in your life what you don't eat. You cannot produce what you don't eat. We're we're made to eat this fruit. I'm not getting this across to you, am I? We're not called. How many of us have read this scripture and struggled like I skip over this page, like I'm not doing any of these things. <laughs> I'm really bad at this fruit of the spirit stuff. You know why I'm bad of it or why I'm bad at it is because religion brainwashed me into thinking that I lacked it and I had to create it and cultivate it and develop it and produce it for others. When God isn't telling me to do that, he's telling me to eat thereof. There's no law against these things, meaning there's no law prohibiting you or forbidding you from eating as much of it as you want. That's exactly what it means. But religion, you don't hear that. In most churches, you're going to go and preachers are going to say, now you need to walk in love. You need to make sure you walk in love because your faith won't work without love. You know, faith works by love. Faith doesn't work by our love. Faith works by God's love. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, he said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. The reason why Jesus wasn't tempted to turn the stones into bread, he said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But that's what he said. But what he but what was underneath it that caused him to say it was the devil was trying to get him to doubt the father's love for him. This is what Satan was after. He wasn't after turn these stones into bread. He was after stop believe like God doesn't love you. He, you're in this wilderness and you can't eat. And God's been depriving you of food and because he doesn't love you. This is what Satan is really trying to say. He doesn't love you. So he's depriving you of this food. And if you'll turn these stones into bread, the temptation wasn't to turn the stones into bread. The temptation was to doubt God's love, that somehow God's love wasn't enough for Jesus that would cause him to need to do a miracle and turn the turn the stones into bread. If you go back to Genesis, that's exactly what the devil tried to tempt Adam and Eve with and succeeded because they they started to doubt God's love. Well, 
God's holding out on you because he knows the day you eat from it, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. So he doesn't want you to be like him. He's withholding from you this fruit. And my Bible says you correct me if I'm wrong, but in Romans chapter eight, thirty two, it says he who did not withhold his only son. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? So the whole the whole point of God's love here is that love does not withhold. 